Hello and welcome to another Real People Big Astronomy program. My name is Renee Kerrigan. I'm a member of the Big Astronomy Leadership Team and it is my honor to have as our guest today for this program Adam Thornton who is a software developer for the Vera Rubin Observatory which is a brand new observatory from the National Science Foundation that will be having its first light here shortly. And Adam has a big job because the Rubin Observatory will uh, generate up to 20 terabytes of data a night. Uh, and it is Adam's job to ensure that the Jupiter Lab based interactive component of the observatory's science platform provides a pleasant way for astronomers to quickly investigate hypotheses based on small but arbitrarily chosen slices of that massive data. So I'm going to uh, enjoy asking Adam some questions tonight about his job. But before I do that, I'd like to just mention the Big Astronomy Project is a National Science Foundation funded project that includes a lot of different components. You can find out all about it by liking us on Facebook. If you're joining this Zoom and Facebook program, you probably already have, but I hope you'll do that. We have a planetarium show that's about these fantastic observatories, but more importantly, the people that make the observatories work. Um, that's available in both English and Spanish, and it is now showing in planetariums across the United States and even internationally. And the planetarium show is available for free or at very low cost. So if you're a planetarium professional, I hope you'll show it in your dome. And if you enjoy visiting planetariums, inquire about uh, getting the show in a dome near you. There is also educational activities that were created for amateur astronomers and uh, informal learning institutions by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Uh, and this live event series um, that can directly connects our viewers with STEM professionals. And finally, there's educational research being done on this program by Michigan State University. And all of you joining us today can be part of that research if you're interested. Um, so that's how you can get involved with Big Astronomy, a little bit about what we are. Now I'm going to go ahead and set up my screen sharing so that I can um, ask Adam the questions and share some pictures. But um, Adam, uh, thank you for being here. Welcome to uh, Big Astronomy. And uh, can you get started just by telling us a little bit um, about your job and uh, a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Um, uh, you went over the, uh, the the main point of my job. So my, my job here is the bottom of those three boxes, uh, sp specifically the things in the notebook section there. And what I've been doing for the last couple of years, and I'm going to continue to do for the next couple of years mostly, is provide the scientists of the Rubin Observatory with a good way to quickly work with uh, data they get. Um, basically, it, it's a, an interactive notebook uh, for a Python environment to allow them to figure out, is the idea they have worth committing tens of thousands of CPU hours to doing on a really big chunk of the data? Or is it you know, an interesting idea that didn't pan out? Um, the, the other two uh, pictures here. so about myself and my job. That's a uh, fairly recent picture of me um, with my dad. Uh, I live in Tucson, which is where the Rubin Observatory headquarters are. Um, we're part of ARA, uh, the Association for University Research and Astronomy, and our headquarters are on the UA campus. Um, Pre-COVID, I had an office there. Post-COVID, presumably I will too, but for the time being, I'm working from home. Um, and the, that picture is me and my dad sitting uh, on my porch. And then the other picture is a little swimming hole that uh, I and a friend and one of my coworkers um, found uh, while hiking uh, in Tank Verde Canyon. Uh, right now it's a little bit low and dry since the temperatures this week have been about 110 Fahrenheit, but pretty soon the monsoons will come and then the swimming hole will refill and the temperatures will drop and we can uh, go back to hiking and swimming. Um, so uh, I can go into more detail about the job, but I think there are questions later where that is probably more appropriate. 
Well, thank you, because I, I have um, learned from doing programs like this that sometimes my questions are too specific, and it's helpful to have sort of that broad look to start off with about, about what your job is. And I know it's an important job because um, the Rubin Observatory, when it, it does come online, it's going to generate so much data. I, I liked how you put it that uh, it's important for astronomers to be able to sort of figure out if it's worth committing so many CPU hours to sort of mining that data on the, on the question um, that they'll be pursuing. It looks beautiful uh, where you hike and, and go swimming. Oh, it, it is. Tucson is beautiful. It's a little brutally hot right now, but um, I, I heartily recommend it as a place to move. So can you tell us a little bit about your path, about how you got to this job, about where you are today? Okay, so my path is fairly non-traditional. I do not have an astronomy background. Um, the picture you see there is a gear from the Antikythera mechanism, which is a uh, first century BC uh, device um, found in a shipwreck, uh, which was in fact a mechanical calculator for determining where celestial objects were. It also had a number of uh, notations on the dials indicating when various uh, festivals and competitions like, like the Olympic games happened uh, across the Greek world. And the reason that's there is that uh, my undergraduate background is history of science. Um, I started off trying to be a physicist. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, that didn't work out. Then I was a historian of science for a while. Then I was within that doing history of computing. And then it was the dot-com boom. And it was a lot less fun to sit and write about people who'd gotten to play with computers than it was to go play with computers. And it paid a lot better too, to be a practitioner. And then there was 20-ish uh, years of consulting in IT more or less. And then at one point, my boss, Frosty Economy was running sort of an informal lecture series where people she knew online and you know, we'd known each other since Usenet days, late nineties, I think. Um, when she knew that people were working on interesting things, she would invite them out to talk. And I did, I came out, I gave a talk about the virtualization and containerization stuff I was doing at the time for a startup. And she said, hey, if that startup doesn't work out, give me a call. And it didn't, and I did, and here I am now. That's so cool. What a, uh, I love learning about people's paths um, because they're never, it's, it, well, I shouldn't say never, but it's rare that it's a straight path from one point to another in people's careers. And it's, I find it really interesting that you started off studying the history of, of science and the history of um, these sorts of uh, mathematics and that sort of thing. And then uh, eventually found yourself in, into this um, uh, career it, it, that is, going to be uh, so heavy in with data, as, as I'm sure, and all the different things you have done in your career have been. Have you always worked in the Tucson area? No, no. I, um, I grew up outside Atlanta, went to college in Houston, went to graduate school in New Jersey, um, moved to St. Louis in 2000 or 99, 2000. Don't quite remember now. Um, uh, and then... Uh, stayed in St. Louis until I moved here in 2016. So mo most of my adult life, um, most of my post-secondary education life anyway, has been uh, in St. Louis. Um, I'm, I'm relatively new to Tucson. Well, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from uh, Peoria, Illinois. So right in the right above St. Louis. So I, I visited Tucson and it's, it's very different and very beautiful. Um, so what would you say uh, the biggest challenge has been in your career and how did you deal with it? Okay, so this is not a particularly technical answer. The, this is about existential despair and consulting. Um, so after a while of doing sort of interesting boutique consulting um, in uh, living in St. Louis, but working for a company that I helped found uh, in the DC suburbs, um, my spouse at the time became ill and the traveling schedule that being a consultant required or that con that consultancy required anyway was no longer feasible. So 
St. Louis being St. Louis, where I ended up was Express Scripts, which is a pharmacy benefits management company. And then after that, I was doing more consulting for healthcare adjacent IT. And it became increasingly clear to me that what my actual job was, was, well, it was described as um, driving efficiencies in the healthcare market. And what that really meant was building more and more accurate analytic tools for places to be able to decide just how many more nurses they could fire before the wrongful death lawsuits cost more than the payroll they'd saved. And that was not a good way to wake up every morning, realizing that was what I was enabling. And so, you know, there, that, that caused a big crisis of conscience. I mean, the pay was good, but I really hated what I was doing. And thankfully, you know, Frosty came along and saved me. Well, and, and uh, I think, you know, realizing that you were working for something that you didn't feel good about, it was, you know, you weren't adding benefit to people's lives at that point, I'm sure, or it, I'm, maybe that, I'm surmising that's how you felt. Well, I, I, I was adding benefits to the wrong people's lives, right? <laughs> I, I was making the, the people who are already rich off of being, you know, healthcare, IT, logistics, whatever companies, we're getting richer and the people who are, you know, supposed to be receiving the medical care were getting the screws tightened more and more on them. And no, I, that, that was not a good feeling. Right. So I, I was, what I was about to um, segue into is I hope that that uh, working for an observatory, uh, which will be, you know, a new type of observatory where the, the data is sort of open source and available to astronomers, uh, you know, instantly around the world. Um, you'll be contributing to the to discovery and, and good. I, I, I imagine that feels much different. It, it does, and much, much better. It's, it's nice, you know, waking up and being not just excited about the technical problems in front of me for work, but like the thing we are building is really neat. And we're going to learn an awful lot of really cool stuff at sort of all astronomical scales from, you know, solar system objects to really big questions about cosmology from this thing and i'm helping it's great yeah, that's wonderful <laughs> and what a what a change i can't imagine how how good that must feel so, so that's actually a great way to ask the next question which is what is your favorite thing about your job and why okay so the uh, logo there is square which is the name of my group um currently that expands to science quality and reliability engineering we have a new acronym coming up, but we're, we have a new unpacking of the acronym, but keeping the square name as we move into operations, and it is eluding me at the moment. Um, so that, that team is within data management, which handles, you know, processing what comes off the telescope um, within the Rubin Observatory. And uh, square is, you know, fewer than 10 people. Um, and they're great. This is the best team I've ever worked for. My boss is the best boss I've ever worked for. Not, not only is she very good at hiring, I mean, she does have a pattern. Mo most of us are um, generalists, but, but she hires very smart people who tend to have not quite the same backgrounds. And so we're all good at slightly different things. She's good at putting us on things that motivate us, at keeping, you know, upper management meetings away at unfortunately great cost to her having to go to a lot of meetings and the great thing is she's managed to hire a bunch of people who all play well together i really I, I adore the other folks on my team um it this this is the best job with the best team i've ever had and um you know and and she's she's done a great job uh, managing and coordinating this and you know it's also nice to have a management team that like works pretty well all the way up. I mean, at least within the project. And I, I'm sure there are like funding fights between our project and other ARA funded projects, but those are so far above my pay grade. I never hear about them, but you know, we're, we are all working towards a common end, which is very different than working in industry where effectively each vice president is trying to build his own little fiefdom at the expense of other fiefdoms. And there's so much backstabbing that it's difficult to get work done across uh, across teams, which is so much not the case at Ruben. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, my, my very favorite thing, yes, the, the technical challenges are great, but my coworkers and my boss. And that's, that's really lovely to hear because it, it just goes to show that, um, that 
no matter what you're interested in or no matter where where your career path might be or you know your passions are the people you work with are really the you know most important part of of your job it's it's uh, that's something I've heard from other people I've talked with with this program as well that they really enjoy their team and uh, it seems like observatories I'm sure there are places that are, are different but it seems like maybe uh, there's a good culture of team building um, and that's part of the success of some of these places which is fantastic um, so we always ask this we ask two sides of the coin right so we ask your favorite part of your job and why so we always ask what's your least favorite thing about your job and why? All right, so th this again is an answer that, well, Randall Monroe in the next KCD comic, and I, I'm afraid I did not uh, memorize the number of the comic, uh, answered. Um, fundamentally, astronomical software has been written by astronomers and usually has been written by particular astronomers who had a particular problem in mind that they wanted to solve for themselves right then. Um, that does not lend itself to particularly good software engineering practices, and it means that in general in astronomy there has been a lot of wheel reinvention, and it means that a lot of packages, even those that a lot of people use, you know, were, were not really engineered in a particularly thoughtful way. Um, that's certainly changed for the better in the last decade or two, um, and it's certainly something that, you know, Square and data management more generally are trying very hard to do. But there's, there's a lot to overcome. Um, and I mean, it, it's not that astronomers are wrong about the incentives, right? Nobody wins a Nobel Prize for the quality of their software. Um, but it, it does mean that uh, you know, one has to accommodate some uh, fairly creaky old stuff, um, which I, I am proud to say, no, we do not provide a Fortran interface in, in our uh, Jupyter Lab environment. <laughs> Um, but, you know, although, although the state of astronomical software has historically not been great, now we, we are doing better. And certainly one of the things I would like to see, and this is complicated by funding incentives because funding, NSF funding in particular, but academic funding generally is project-based. And like the stuff I'm doing is very useful for the Rubin Observatory. And that's, it is my job to write stuff that is useful for the Rubin Observatory, but also a lot of it I think would be easily generalizable to other sort of large scale, um, large data reduction scientific problems. And it would be great if there were some way that we could leverage that so that, uh, you know, the next people doing something sort of conceptually similar did not have to invent their own wheel. Now, granted, because Almost all of our work is open source, right? Uh, people can go and get the stuff I and the rest of the Rubin Observatory developers have written and try to adapt it. But you now it, it would be nice to see sort of national scale computing infrastructure at a software engineering level rather than just a data center level really take off. I, I um, what you're saying makes perfect sense. And I imagine it is just so, uh, the the problem the scale of the problem of trying to organize from the top down like an organizational structure must be uh, so daunting um, but I uh, I commend you for any effort you might make to try because <laughs> um, I imagine that I can totally see how that would be super frustrating um, and a problem that's existed for a long time I'm sure um, well, we always like to ask as well about your favorite astronomical object. So what is your favorite astronomical object? It took some thought here, but uh, as you may recognize, that, that's M31, the Andromeda galaxy. And the reason I picked Andromeda is because if you know where to look, right, there's a little fuzzy blob there and you can stand there and look up at it with your naked eye or even my naked eyes, which are not very good anymore, and see it and be like, wow, the photons that are hitting my retina have traveled for 2 million years to get to my eyeballs, which is just the sort of thing that gives me goosebumps. And I mean, of course, Andromeda is the closest galaxy, right? The, the, the Rubin Observatory is going to see things much, 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 much farther away. But you know, the fact that I can go out into my backyard and look up at the sky and see something 2 million light years away is just mind boggling to me. And uh, in 
I agree with you. It's wonderful. Uh, if you haven't seen the, uh, too many of our viewers on Facebook or here in Zoom, if you haven't had an opportunity to see the closest large galaxy or to our, cell, our own, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy in the night sky, you can do it in the fall. And I was lucky enough to have some observing time at Kitt Peak outside of Tucson once. And man, is it a great place to view the night sky. Some of the best observing I've ever done um, was at Kitt Peak. And you can see Andromeda excellent uh, there, naked eye, without any, uh, without any magnification. So um, a little shout out to visit, again, Tucson and, and Kitt Peak nearby. Uh, if you have an opportunity. And heck, if we're talking about great places to observe the night sky, go to Chile if you have an opportunity because it's a fantastic place to observe the night sky where the Rubin Observatory um, is is completing its construction right now. Um, um, oh, but yeah. before, I, before I dive into the typical day at work, there is another program at Kitt Peak that I assume is going to come back after COVID called Meteor Mania. And it's amazing, especially if you go, you know, when it's near a new moon because there if assuming it's a good shower you can see an astonishing number of meteors and it's the first time in my life i've been able to see not just the milky way but the dust lanes in the milky way wow. and it like if you're in tucson and there is a meteor mania event like definitely sign up for it and drive out to kit peak and go do it because it is fantastic make time and and even if you can't go at night just visit kit peak during the day it's beautiful and uh, there's a lot of great history there, and uh, it's it's run by great people. So here's your here's your commercial free of charge commercial for Kit Peak Observatory and and visiting it. Um, so our our next and and um, I think last or close to the last question is could you uh, not quite last, but could you describe your typical day at work? So what does a day at work look like for you? All right, so th this is a picture of our Jupyter Lab interface. It's running one of our tutorial notebooks, um, and you know, making making this interface uh, pleasant to work with uh, is most of what I'm doing. In fact, uh, off to my left right now, I'm I am watching uh, how the lab is spawning under simulated load of 400 users because data preview 0.1 happens at the end of this month. And we are turning loose 300 people who have not been part of the project on it. And I want to get some characterization of how it reacts to larger loads than we have so far seen. Um, but a, a typical day is basically I write some Python. I may end up doing some TypeScript if I'm working on some of the some of the UI components. Um, but you know, I, I I have always been sort of a backend systems administrator. Uh, kind of guy. And so mostly I write infrastructure stuff. And on this project, it's mostly in Python. Um, so I spend a lot of time in front of a computer screen. And then we, we also like to ask um, a typical day at home. And right now, and I know that right now, it's like they're almost the same, right? Because a lot of folks are still working at home. Right, right, right now, indeed, they are the same thing, which is why on the leftmost screen there, the center of the screen is that same uh, Python is that same Jupyter Lab notebook running the same Python code? Um, you can see my little border collie Naga underneath my desk. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the stuff to the right and left uh, on on a future slide. But you know, basically, I come into the my home office and I sit down. Or within the last week, I've gotten a standing desk, so maybe I stand up for a couple hours. And I stand there and I think and I write code and I work and I try not to get too distracted by my dogs. Sometimes it's good to have a little bit of little bit of distraction, though. Uh, so, uh, what was your favorite subject? We asked this, I should say, about your favorite subject in school because it's, it's sometimes surprising, and we also like to help people understand that, you know, not everyone who ends up in science loved science in school or uh, felt like they were, you know, great at it in school. But uh, we maybe and some people it, it it was their favorite subject in school, of course. So, um, what was your favorite subject when you were in school? So I, I took in school to be um, college, and uh, this is this is a picture of a water-driven organ uh, invented by Hero of Alexandria in the first century AD. Um, and uh, history of science was, you know, very formative. Um, basically, I, I was at Rice, and the next slide will explain what happened before this. And I ended up doing um, 
I ended up in a major that was ancient Mediterranean civilization. Um, and in so doing, some of the electives were history of science courses. And I met a man named Albert Van Helden, who is one of the uh, foremost Galileo experts in the world and was the history of science department at, at Rice, or was the history of science guy within the history department. And I took all of his classes and I really loved doing that. And he convinced me to apply to graduate school in the history of science. And you know, I, I absolutely love doing it. Um, I, I like, it, 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 is, it is fun to see the through lines of thought and philosophy that get us from, well, again, hero, like, huh, if you rub some fur with an amber rod, like sparks jump off of it to, you know, telegraphs to the internet. <laughs> um. I found too, when I've read um, history of science books and more popular fiction or more popular nonfiction than what you I'm sure studied in school. But whenever I've read about the history of science, it helps me understand the concepts because when you can understand how people came to the understandings that they have, you know, about the way the world works, um, I find it's easier to understand a complicated topic when you know the history of how it was discovered. So that's, that's very cool. So then the, here we have the, the other side of the coin, the least favorite subject you studied in school. Partial differential equations. I <laughs> went to college with every intention of being a physicist. Um, I, my first mistake was taking the math rather than the applied math version of PDEs, but I'm not so sure it was actually a mistake because although I squeaked through that class with a C, I also had a moment of clarity that if I became a physicist, a really terrifying proportion of the remainder of my lifespan was going to be spent solving PDEs, which was not something that brought me any pleasure at all. Um, hence, uh, a change of majors and a real change of life goals and paths. And that's that's uh, uh, great because you found you landed in a place that's really uh, fulfilling. And, and that's, I think, fascinating. I've talked to so many people who had some something that they, they thought was, you know, that they were going to study and, and their path and then, you know, something else caught their passions or, or there was something they realized, oh, I don't, I don't want to do that after all. Um, okay, so here, this is, is our actual last question, but we, we always like to help people know, of course, everyone who works in science is a real person who has, uh, you know, a real life outside of their job. Um, and so we'd like to ask what you do for fun. And then we do have some visitor or some uh, viewer questions that I'll be asking uh, at the end here as well. Okay, so starting counterclockwise from the upper left, um, that first uh, mostly vertical slide is part of my um, computer museum, I suppose one would say. This is the shelf in my office, which is mostly 80s and 90s, um, uh, 16 and 32 and a few 64-bit uh, mini and micro computers. Um, I like collecting old machines and restoring them to uh, more or less functionality and then playing with them for a while. And so um, right, right now I am on a... Uh, big digital equipment corporation kick. I've got a, a running back station. I've got the Pi emulated PDP-11 up in the upper left of that picture. I've got a real PDP-11 whose power supply I need to work on. Um, and I also do 8-bit uh, and 16-bit home computers and video game consoles. Um, and uh, all, all, all of that is a, a good fun way to spend weekends when it's too hot to do another of the things. So going down from there, bottom left, I have three dogs, Spot, Naga, and Blink uh, from left to right. And uh, they share my house. They sleep on the couch or the bed. They help me work and they keep me sane. Um, the next picture is looking down into Tank Verde Canyon from the Canyon Rim. Um, this is one of the favorite places I've got to hike. The, uh, the watering hole we saw on the first uh, slide is if you keep going up that canyon, go around the bend to the left and go about another half mile, you're at it. Um, and then the last thing you can see Blink's nose as I am uh, creating a cocktail and judging from the ingredients, it's some kind of an eggnog. I, I like uh, making and consuming um, overcomplicated craft cocktails. It's mixology is uh, you know one of my hobbies. 
It all sounds like a lot of fun, and I'm, I'm really glad to hear that um, not only do you collect old technology, but you, you get it running again, because I think that's an important, sorry, there's a motorcycle going by. I think that's an um, important part of that hobby, otherwise um, it wouldn't be collecting uh, and restoring. It could just be sort of, you know, collecting. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, there, there, are, there are different types of collectors, and I am not the kind who tries to find the shrink-wrapped thing so you can show the unboxing after 40 years in storage no i mean i i like to get it and you know replace what needs replacing and get it to a state where i can play with it again uh so we thank you adam for telling us about thank your you. job thank you for uh, telling us a little bit about your life it, it's really interesting i appreciate your honest conversation with us today um and we do have some questions so um one question is uh, about uh, the Rubin Observatory itself, more so than about your um, specific part of your role at the Rubin Observatory, but Stephen wants to know what impact might thousands of new and future low Earth orbiting uh, satellites have on the research that's going to be done on the Vera Rubin Telescope? And thank you, uh, he says, for a, a great presentation. So the, the answer is quite a lot. Um, constellations, uh, Effectively, for a project like ours, which is a wide survey thing, some number of pixels in any given image are going to be unusable. I mean, particularly our detector saturates at um, 16th magnitude, I think. So, uh, you know, there, there are always plenty of bright foreground objects that wash out stuff around them. Um, what what uh, Starlink or something like that does is adds a lot more pixels that are washed out in the foreground that you therefore can't use. So it's a reduction of efficiency. It's not huge. Um, I know that the observatory has been uh, talking to Elon Musk about ways to mitigate the effects. Um, you know, it, it, it is as always a trade-off that like dark skies would be really nice for what we do. But on the other hand, like cheap low latency communication wherever on the planet you are is also pretty societally important. So you know, I, we, we try not to complain too much and it, uh, you know, it, it, it is certainly an annoyance for the project, but it is not the end of the world. Um, as, as other companies launch their own constellations and the skies become more and more cluttered, that could change, but you know, we'll cross that bridge when we have to. Yeah, and uh, it's something that uh, pe uh, people in the astronomy education uh, field are, are concerned about, but I have heard that uh, the observatories are working with the companies, and it's good to hear from somebody who works at the observatory that it's, you know, it's a problem, but it's something that can be, that can be um, managed, because as you say, as um, everything's a trade-off. Um, so Nathan would like to know, um, what are the more typical problems that you are solving with your job. So he's wondering if it's big data with Python, does that mean you're parsing imagery or stitching pictures or animating areas of space? Um, and he also wants to know what tools you find most valuable in doing that work. Okay, so at, at, at the 50,000 foot level, right, what we are doing is we are taking lots and lots and lots of rectangles with dots on them, um, correlating those over space and time where we were pointing, pointing and when we were pointing to uh, assemble a, a catalog of objects in space. And you know, what, what do we think it is? Where do we think it is in re relative to us in the cosmos? Um, so in, in a sense, it is all a very large image processing problem. And that, that's beta, basically what the data management pipeline software, which my stuff wraps, does um, you know my? But uh, because we are taking so much data, roughly fifteen to twenty terabytes of image data a night. Um, well, uh, of data a night. Uh, the e each image is uh, how many? Three point two gigapixels, I think. Um, at 18 bit grayscale, you know, and we'll take it in a particular band with a particular filter. At any rate, right, there, there are so many pictures and they are so huge that to a first approximation, no one ever actually looks 
at the pixels coming off the camera, right? We are relying very heavily on reducing that into an object catalog and then people will work with the things in the catalog, which is basically a very complexly structured database. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 it is very much it, it is very much how do we apply the collected knowledge of thousands of astronomer years to turn rectangles with dots on them into these complex databases about which we can ask interesting questions about the universe. Uh, so I think that, thank you uh, for answering Nathan's question, Adam, and uh, Philip might have a, well, kind of related question, but it's about Python. He says, does the inefficiency of Python at runtime impact the work you are doing from a fellow software geek, he parentheses. So much of the data management processing pipeline is actually written in C++ with uh, Python bindings to it. So all of the scientist facing code is uh, Python, but the actual um, difficult deep blending and image processing stuff is written in C++ for, precisely for that reason, because it is much, much faster. Um, now, I, I'd like to believe that if we were starting this in 2021 and not you know, 2008, we'd probably be using something more like Rust, but well, we, 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 we work with the tools that we designed when we started the project, so fair enough. Well, Adam, thank you so much. I really enjoyed uh, talking with you today. It's very interesting to learn about your job, which is, you know, uh, very different from mine. I always love learning about people's jobs uh, and a little bit about your life. And, and we had a lot of really uh, interested uh, folks uh, who from all around the United States who asked uh, some questions. We are we are running out of time, uh, so I will just go ahead and mention to everyone watching that uh, Big Astronomy is a research project. It's funded by the National Science Foundation, the same organization that uh, funds the Vera Rubin Observatory. So if you'd like to support our project, we'll be putting in the comments on Facebook a um, link for a survey that you could fill out and everyone who fills out the survey will be entered into a drawing for a G Amazon gift card and it, it will help us to uh, gather some data about our project. So we'd appreciate you filling that out. And uh, again, we also appreciate you. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter on bigastronomy.org and uh, you can follow us along on Facebook and other social media platforms. And we have another program coming up next month, um, also featuring a data management software scientist for the Rubin Observatory, Andres Alejandro Palazas Malagon. Um, that's on July 30th at the same time, 8 p.m. Uh, Chile time and Eastern Daylight Time. And uh, that's 5 p.m. in Tucson. So if you've enjoyed tonight's program, I hope you'll tune in again. And uh, let's all give Adam a virtual round of applause. Thank you for uh, presenting uh, today. We really enjoyed it. And uh, thank, we'll... thank you for having me on. It was uh, it was delightful. Great. Uh, well, I'll see everyone next time. I hope. Uh, thanks for tuning in to Real People, Big Astronomy. Thank you.